notice with me Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's Word is the foundation for our faith, the final authority for our lives, and the eternal truth by which we stand. It is medicine for our bodies, it is nourishment for our souls, and it is a light for our eyes. We cannot overemphasize the importance of God's Word in the life of every believer. And any attempt to minimize the value of Scripture or to somehow remove the Bible from its rightful place, any attempt to do that is misguided and even dangerous. Smith Wigglesworth, who I refer to frequently, said this, the Bible is the Word of God, supernatural in origin, eternal in duration, inexpressible in valor, infinite in scope, regenerative in power, infallible in authority, universal in interest, personal in application, inspired in totality. Read it through, write it down, pray it in, work it out, and then pass it on. Truly, it is the Word of God. It brings into man the personality of God. It changes the man until he becomes the epistle, a living letter from God himself. It transforms his mind. Hallelujah. It changes his character. It takes him on from grace to grace and gives him an inheritance in the spirit. Can somebody say amen to that? Hallelujah. Amen. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and active. One translation says, it is a living thing. You know, some people say things like this. You know, when, when pastor preaches the Word of God, he makes the Bible come alive. No, friend, that's not true. The Bible's already alive. Amen. But just as the life of the seed is not released until it is planted in the soil, so God's living word is not activated until it is received and believed in your heart. I want to talk about the importance of the word of God. Three times in the Gospel of John, Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. Isn't that interesting? He didn't even call Him the Spirit of power. He called Him the Spirit of truth. But what is truth? Well, in John 17, verse 17, Jesus was praying, and He said to the Father, Your Word is truth. So we could put these two verses together and say the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Word. Your Word is truth. So you need to understand this. The Holy Spirit always works by and with the truth of God's Word. Like one pastor friend of mine said many years ago, I never forgot it, the demonstration of God's power is always preceded by a declaration of His truth. Some people want power, but they don't want the Word. It doesn't work that way. Friends, the Bible itself is the product of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, talking about the Scriptures, Peter says... Men spoke from God as they were carried along 
by the Holy Spirit. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You know, the New Testament was written in Greek. The Greek word pharaoh, pharaoh, means to be conducted or transported, transported, born or transported by something of great force or with great speed. See, the same Greek word is used in Acts 27 and verse 15, and it describes how the ship Paul was traveling on was driven by a great storm. The same word, Pharaoh, is used in Acts chapter 2, verse 2, when it talks about a mighty rushing wind. Same word. You see, the thought expressed in this verse is not that the Holy Spirit gave these men a subtle, gentle urging or prompting or a little bit encouragement. That's not the idea at all. The Greek paints a picture of men who were, com who were swept away in a tsunami of God's Spirit. Have you ever, you know, you, you've, you've heard the testimonies of people who were caught in a terrible tsunami. It's like this huge wall of water came their way. Just this verse describes men who are completely taken over by the Spirit of God, and God spoke through them. Are you out there today? Hallelujah. So it's interesting, in Romans chapter 3, verse 2, in the New International Version, Paul says the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. He about the Old Testament law and the prophets. The Jews were entrusted with the very words of God. See, there are some Christians, and, and perhaps in, 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 in theological seminary or Bible college, they were taught. Well, see, you know, the, the law was orally transmitted, you know, over a long period of time, you know, just one person sharing the story with another generation to generation. And of course, over such a long period of time, you know, the facts got altered and the message was somehow changed. That is patently untrue. That is false. That is heresy. And if you believe that, it's no wonder you don't have any faith. It is God's Word given by the Holy Spirit, and every single word is from God. Are you here today? Hallelujah. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, notice the Scripture. Are you still here today? It's real quiet. May I turn your volume up? Are you still here today? Oh, praise God. Notice this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. The Word of God is working in believers. The Word of God is working in believers. The Passion Translation says, and the Word continues to be an energizing force in you who believe. See, there's a difference. There's a difference between you and just some other fellow on the street. And it's not because you've got a Bible under your elbow. It's not because you've got a cross around the neck. It's not because you've got a little bumper sticker on your car that says, in case of rapture, vehicle will be unoccupied. There's a difference. There's an energizing force working in you because you believe. But why? Come on, folks. Why is it that the Word of God is not an energizing force in some people's lives? Now, obviously, some people just reject the word outright. They dismiss it. They just charge it. And even in the church world, some people, you know, as you're preaching the truth, they don't like it. And they may smile on the outside, but inside they're frowning. See? And, but, you know, God doesn't see your outside. He sees your inside. He knows whether you believe the word of God or not. Amen? 
But then again, others receive it, but only as man's message and not as God's Word. I'm not talking about my sermon. I'm talking about the Scriptures. They receive it only as man's message and not God's Word. To them, the Bible is nothing more than a collection of ancient sacred writings to be appreciated and admired, sure, but not to be taken literally. Have you ever noticed how some people always call the Bible the good book? Well, as the good book says, I don't like that because to me that somehow diminishes what it really is. It's not just some nice religious book, the sayings of, 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 of Confucius or Aesop or something. It's God's Word. It's God's holy Word. That's what God thinks about it. That's what you need to think about it as well. Can I get some kind of response right now? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Now, some people... Even in the church world, folks, some people will say things like, oh, but Brother John, men wrote the Bible. Men wrote the Bible. See? Well, if I wrote a letter to you, would you say, now, Brother John did not write this letter. The gel pen did. Oh, you're so smart. Blazing intellect is, is blinding my eyes at this moment. Yes, obviously ink did not come out of my finger as I ran it across the page. You are correct, Einstein. But on the other hand, the gel pen did not jump up by itself on the paper and just start writing. It was in my hand as an instrument. I guided its every move. In fact, if you really knew me, you would recognize whether that letter was for me or not. Say, that, that's his handwriting. I know his handwriting. That's him. God used men to pen the Scriptures, but they were the instrument in his hand. He guided them. He directed them. He spoke through them. Are you out there today? When I read the Bible, figuratively speaking, I recognize God's handwriting. I know that's from Him, which I don't see in other things that I read. Hallelujah. It's interesting, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, before quoting from Psalm 95, Paul, uh, uh, some people are not sure whether Paul wrote Hebrews because he never gives his name. It doesn't really matter today, but I'm fully convinced Paul did write it. Before quoting Psalm 95, Paul says this, writes this, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, then he quotes the verse. Today, if you'll hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Then again in Hebrews 10, verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, and then he quotes from Jeremiah chapter 31. Notice, that's what he said. Then again, in Acts chapter 1, verse 16, Peter with the apostles in that upper room, they were talking about Judas who had betrayed the Lord and committed suicide. And Peter says, the Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David. And then he refers to two Scriptures, Psalm 69, verse 25, and Psalm 109, verse 8. The same verses are in your Bible. Then again, in Acts chapter 4, verse 25, the apostles came together and they prayed because they, were, they, were, they had been arrested because they were threatened by the chief priests and the elders. And they, and they began to saying, Lord, you are God. You made heaven and earth. And then they said, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. And then they quoted the second psalm. Notice. Peter, Paul, the other apostles, they did not say, 
our forefathers wrote these words a long time ago, and we cherish them, and, you know, we respect them. No. They said, Lord, you said this by the Holy Spirit. You used people like David. You used his mouth, but these are your words. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit works with the word. In Mark chapter 16, verse 20, some of you are real quiet. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But in Mark chapter 16, verse 20, the New King James Version says this, and they went out and preached everywhere. But that's not all. That's not all it says. Some, some, some churches only know that part. But wait a minute. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs, amen. The Holy Spirit confirms the word. He's a confirmation giving spirit. So if there is no confirmation, if there are no accompanying signs, if there's no demonstration of God's working, his power, it's because you're not preaching the word. It's real quiet in this Presbyterian church. Are you out there today? We said social distancing, not social silence. Are you out there today? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, uh, Brother Hagen was for many years a Baptist pastor. And then later he got baptized with the Holy Spirit. He humorously says he received the left foot of fellowship from the Baptist. Uh, he was excommunicated. So he, he started pastoring Pentecostal churches. So he pastored for like 12 years. And so he said that uh, one day he was in his uh, uh, st pastor's study or something, and he was praying. And he said, Lord, we just don't see enough supernatural signs in our church. You know, I mean, people get saved, and that's wonderful, and, you know, occasionally, you know, somebody gets healed, but we're just not seeing enough demonstration. Where are the accompanying signs? So he's praying, and I think he spent some time seeking the Lord, and the, and the Holy Spirit said to him, well, the reason you're not seeing any accompanying signs is you're not preaching the Word. Brother Hagin said he felt insulted. Every, any pastor would. He felt insulted. And he said, Lord, you know I preach the word. Listen today, all over the world, every pastor and every pulpit would say, I preach the word. But do they? All over the world today, every Christian says, I believe the word. But do they? If you do, there will be evidence of it in your life. One evidence is showing up for church no matter what the newspaper says. Hallelujah. No fear here. Ooh, it's real quiet. I feel so alone. Just me and Jesus up here. You guys staring at me. It looks like I don't have a friend in the world. Are you Christians or is this the People's Communist Party? <laughs> Amen. And, and as Brother Hagin was praying, he said, suddenly I had a vision and he said, my, my body became transparent like glass. And I could look inside myself, and I looked down deep in me, and I saw something that looked like a, a, like a crow or a raven, like a, like a big black bird. And it came up. This is like the, the, the Lord's teaching him, you see. And so he, he was shocked, and he said, what's that? And the Lord said to him, that's your Baptist tradition. Aloshe, <laughs> Jehovah say. So he, he reached in and he pulled that thing. He didn't know that that's in me. And, and, he, and, he, and he pulled it out of him. And then he looked again and he said, I saw something. It looked like a, a tin can, you know, like a tinna, a little bit rusty, but somewhat, you know, shiny. And he, and he said, what's that? And the Lord said, that's your Pentecostal tradition. Shundai, untie my bow tie, DDD. So he pulled that out too. And then the Lord said, see that you preach my word. So he examined, well, what have I been preaching? And he found out to his astonishment, he was preaching, you know, a little bit of word, but a whole lot of human reasoning. 
and a lot of just religious tradition. And he said, sometimes in the pulpit, I had to stop myself and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not true. And he had to take it back and say, no, this is what the Bible says. You know, just because you repeat what others are saying, that doesn't make it true. I think Abraham Lincoln said, if 15,000 people say a stupid thing, it's still a stupid thing. I know that's deep for some of you. Write it down, meditate on it. The Lord will give you revelation. (laughs) Right? So you need to be careful. You're not just echoing what other people are saying. It might not be true. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. So he began to preach the word, and they began to have miraculous signs in their church. I don't mean to say that every Sunday somebody has to be healed, or every Sunday there has to be some kind of a, a supernatural thing, but there should be some response from the Spirit of God in people's lives. Hallelujah. In John 8.31, in John 8.31, Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. If you abide in my word, you are true. Notice he didn't just say if you abide in the church pew. (laughs) He said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. The Greek word translated abide, meno, means to continue with, to stay in, remain, not depart, dwell, live in. If you live in, continue, remain, stay with my word, then you're truly my disciple. In other words, if you are not following the word of God, you are not following Jesus. You may think you are, but you're not. Are you listening today? To the extent that we deviate from the Scriptures, we stray into error. Some people keep the Bible at a distance. You know, it's, it's just, you know... It's just there on the bookshelf. It's just something they turn to once in a while. And that's, those are the people who get into difficulty. This is the roadmap for life. And if you don't want to get lost, you better keep it before your eyes day and night. You know, um, a pilot, uh, like uh, a, a lo- uh, 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 flying a large uh, airliner, a Boeing uh, Airbus jet, He must continually correct himself because the winds are blowing. You know, you may just set your course, you know, headed due north, but the winds will blow you off course. The weather will will, will cause you to to, to, to be off even, even just three degrees, just three degrees. But if he doesn't correct himself and keeps on going, instead of landing, you know, in Delhi, he'll land in Islamabad. Likewise, if you don't constantly correct yourself with the truth of God's Word, you're going to get further and further and further and further away from the will of God for your life. See, a lot of people don't want any correction. If you, you know, if you just even mildly suggest maybe it might be a good idea to kind of make some change, they get red-faced and, and, and steamy and, and smoke comes out of their nostrils and they, leave, they stomp out and they never come back again. If you're teachable, you're reachable. Did Jesus give correction to his disciples? How many of you have ever said, I wish... I just wish I was living back then. Oh, that would be so wonderful just to be with him as he, you know, raised Lazarus and walked on. Oh, are you sure you, about that? Because when I read the Bible, I, I realize that Jesus sometimes had some harsh word for his disciples. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Come on, if Jesus said that to some of you, you you'd become a Buddhist. You'd, you'd never, you'd throw the Bible in the trash can. Come on, you can't be a snowflake. You got to be a man of God. <laughs> you got to have you got to have a little backbone. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, some people I think in general, some people have accused me, your beloved pastor. Some people have accused me of being a Bible thumper. 
He's a Bible thumper. Then again, in the wilderness, when he was tempted by the devil thrice, three times, he responded, it is written. It is written. All in Matthew chapter 4, you know, uh, verses 4, 7, and 10. And then each time he quoted from the book of Deuteronomy. Some people, some people here would never read the book of Deuteronomy, but evidently Jesus did. And he knew it. He knew it well. Hmm? When someone asked Jesus a question about salvation, he responded in Luke chapter 10, verse 26, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He called the Old Testament commandments the Word of God in Mark chapter 7, verse 13. In John 10, 35, he said the Scripture cannot be broken. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 17, he said, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. So, I guess Jesus was a Bible thumper too. So, I take that as a great compliment. Thank you. Amen. So, though he was and is the Son of God, he held the Scriptures in the highest regard, and so should we. Never once do we read, you know, somebody quoted the Bible and Jesus said, ah, Bible schmeibel, I'm the Son of God, I don't need that. He never ever, ever demeaned or diminished or ridiculed in any way the Scriptures. So those people who have that attitude, they're not like Christ. That's true. Real quiet here today. Can somebody say something? Say, oh me, ouch, oy vey, hello sunshine, something, hallelujah. Every now and then breathe. It's good for your brain. All right, now, let's look at another scripture, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. How many of you know this verse already? Okay, I'm so glad you're here today. Romans 10, 17 says this. So faith comes from hearing. We could stop there and preach another sermon, couldn't we? Some people don't want to hear nothing. So then faith comes from hearing, not just sitting, but some broad-bodied women in the church have no faith at all. It comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. So if what you are hearing does not produce faith in you, it's not the Word of God. Many Christians, especially from Nagaland and the Northeast, and other parts of this nation. Many Christians graduated from seminary with less faith than they had when they first enrolled. Why? Because they were not taught the Word of God. They were taught theology. Oh, isn't that the same? No. Never, never the same. Are you here today? I don't mean to be unkind, but then again, I'm not being apologetic for what I say. I'll never apologize for speaking the truth. I, I, I noticed one pastor, he said that every day, every day he reads the writings of one particular theologian. And, and, and he said, and this theologian is well respected in the ecclesiastical world. But one small problem this theologian does not really believe the Bible is God's word. He does not believe the scripture is infallible, he thinks it has errors. He considers the Genesis account of creation to be 
some sort of religious, spiritual saga, but actually God created the world through evolution. And evolution is bunk. If you were here on a Wednesday night, we already proved to you that that's not only not biblical, it's also not even scientific. Huh? Not to mention that the man's writings are full of contradictions. Yet this pastor said he feeds on this every day. Before you accept someone's teachings, take a look at that person's life. Come on, I've said this before, but I think people in Nagaland are probably the most gullible people on the planet. Sorry, I'm saying this as your friend. They believe anything except the truth. I, as a boy, of course, not you, not you. Th th those other people out there, not, not you. As a boy, you know, uh, I played. Ba I was playing baseball with my friends, and it's like it's like cricket. Threw the ball in a bush, so I, I opened the bush to to pull out the ball, and there was a, a nest, a robin, a bird feeding the little the little babies, and the the robin had a a worm in its beak, you know, and little babies had their eyes closed and their mouths wide open. I thought, that's just exactly like so many church members I know. Eyes closed, mouth wide open. Anybody can poke any worm in them. We need to be discerning people. Amen. Uh, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but a Nigerian prophecy is just like a Nigerian email. I should be a multi-billionaire by now, but I still haven't got that. Did you get the money yet? No. <laughs> You'd be a fool to believe some things. You don't even know who these people are. Huh? The person that, that you're reading after, is he born again? <laughs> Gee, that's a good question. Maybe he doesn't even know. Maybe nobody else knows if he's born again. Is he baptized with the Holy Spirit? Well, Brother John, I don't think you should make a big issue of that. Well, Peter was, Paul was, John was. I think that's good company to run with. Do we see the working of God in that person's life? Come on, some theologians have never had a prayer answered. Never. And if you read after them, your prayers won't be answered either. No, I make no apologies for this. I, I live and breathe for the truth of God's Word. Till, till my dying day, I'm going to say, follow the Word of God. Follow the Word of God. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words or persuasive words, of wisdom. He means human wisdom, see. My speech and my message, my, my sermon and, and, and the content of what I was saying was not in persuasive words of just human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith might rest in the wisdom, not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul was one of the most educated men in his day. Highly educated person. You, you can tell just by reading the Bible, highly educated person. Yet he knew that if he preached the gospel with eloquent, impressive words, he would rob the cross of its power. He said, when I came to you, I made a decision. The only thing I know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I didn't come here so that you would be impressed with me, but so that you would be impressed with God. If you impress people, you can't bless people. Are you listening to me? <laughs> Hallelujah. Some theologians camouflage their unbelief with academia. They use difficult understanding words. Nobody can figure out what they really mean. And because you don't know what it means, you think it's profound. Like the time I was preaching years ago, and when I got through, one fellow came up to me and shook my hand so enthusiastically and said, oh, pastor, I know that message was from God. I didn't understand a word you said. 
Now that, that, that's, he took it as a, he thought that he was complimenting me. I took it as correction. Notice this. Jesus never preached anything complex. Not complicated. It's profound, but it was very simple. He talked about sheep and goats and vineyards and wells, things that people, ordinary people who had no education could grasp and understand. So if you hear somebody preaching something that's so murky and nebulous and esoterica and complicated, they did not get it from Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't, don't wade into theology thinking that you'll impress everybody. Maybe they'll be impressed, but that's not the, the, the deal. The deal is to bless. So speak the simple truth. And by the way, when you really know something, you could teach it to the covenant kids. Because they won't put up for that mumbo jumbo. You start just slinging around theological terms with adults, and they, you know, they don't want to say the emperor has no clothes, so they'll say, oh, praise the Lord, Ooh, very good, and what a wonderful message. But the kids will say, what are you talking about? And you'll be exposed. <laughs> Amen. While I'm on the subject, I'm almost done. I know some of you are feeling uncomfortable. Praise the Lord. Parabutos tutiho. Now listen. You need to build your life on the Word. I appreciate music. I, appreciate, I certainly appreciate our praise worship team. I work with them on a lot of things. And, 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 I, and I, I appreciate music. I, I actually have a degree in music. You, you'd never know it today, but at any rate, my father paid for it, so I think in his honor I should tell you about that. But you can't build your life on Christian music. Faith doesn't come by listening to Christian music. I'm not saying anything derogatory against, you know, worship or praise. That, 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 that's the Word of God tells us to do that. But see, some people love music more than Jesus. Huh? Hallelujah. Recently, a worship leader in a very well-known church publicly announced that he had lost his faith and that he's not sure whether he would still consider himself to be a Christian or not. Why? Because people need this truth of God's Word. That's something colored lights and a smoke machine will never give you. You need to give people the Word of God. And you don't need to water down the truth till it's not truth anymore. Just give it to them straight. They need to know what the Bible teaches about the Christian life. They need to be clear in their understanding. Are you out there today? Many churches sing the same songs today. And they have a similar style of worship. The, the stage lighting and presentation, again, is very similar. But what they believe can be quite different. So you, you, should, you should by now know that just uh, colored lights and an FM microphone, that don't mean anything. Anybody can, people in the world do that. But what do we believe? What does the Word of God say? That's where we stand. Are you out there? Some churches today, and I'm speaking in general terms, are still the same dead denominational church they always were, except with some uh, modern updates. Some are still preaching doubt and unbelief with new window dressing. No, friends. We need the Word of God. We need it clear and understandable in our hearts. Can I get an amen today? Praise the Lord. Now, some Christians, I'm almost done. I can see you look impatient. Some Christians, there's no service tonight. Some Christians will argue, yeah, but people that strongly emphasize the Bible, you know, overemphasize the Scriptures, they're just modern-day Pharisees. Ah, just a modern-day Pharisee, legalistic Pharisee. Let me say something to you. In John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees. 
And he said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. But Jesus never criticized the Pharisees for studying the scriptures. He never said, you guys are just wasting your time reading the Bible. He never, ever said that. Huh? He criticized them for not believing it and not practicing it. See? He never criticized the Pharisees for highly esteeming the Word of God. No, 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 no. He criticized them for their hypocrisy. You claim to believe the Bible, but you really don't. That's what he criticized them for. It's true that some people misuse the Word of God. They misinterpret it and they misapply it. That's true. But that is not a valid reason for disregarding the Bible. Huh? Um, just because someone else had an accident in their car doesn't forbid me to drive my car. Make sure that you're not just reacting to someone else's mistake and in doing so are committing your own mistake. Stay with the truth of God's Word, even if other people mess up. Then again, many people are not really following the Word. They're following what they think the Word says. They often have incomplete information. But I want to say this, knowing the Word is a means to an end and not an end in itself. I'm not telling you to study the Bible just because you should study. You know, Bible as literature. Well, I could read Walt Whitman or I could read the Bible. It's, it's not that way. There's a reason why we read the Word of God. I feed on the Word because I want to hear His voice and I want to become more like Him. I love the Word of God, because I love the God of the Word. Are you out there today? And I truly believe if a man falls in love with the Bible, he'll never fall out of love with Jesus. But be a doer of the Word, not just a debater of the Word. Amen? And the Word and the Spirit agree. The Spirit of truth always leads me back to the Word of God. Lynn Hammond pastors a church with her husband in America in the state of uh, Minnesota. And I was so interested to read her testimony. She first got saved and, uh, uh, and was baptized with the Holy Spirit in her own sitting room one night just praying. God filled her, and she began speaking tongues. She doesn't even know what it is. She had a great hunger for God, and that's a good thing. And she spent time every day praying and seeking God, wanting to hear His voice. And she said, one day the Lord spoke to her. The Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, Lynn, I'm the God of the book. If you want to hear my voice, read my word. I think so many lives that we know would be bettered if they would put God's Word ahead of every prophecy, dream, feeling, uh, vision, or anything else, put His Word first in their life. They would be less susceptible to deception. They wouldn't be pulled and swayed by every wind of doctrine. Their lives would be solid, and they'd be strong, and yes, they'd be more spiritual too. Can I get an amen? Would you stand with me to your feet? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 